to Faith Assembly with Senior Pastor Brian Keith. Join us each week as we learn from God's Word and apply it to our lives. As you're doing that, open up to Ezekiel chapter 47, and we're going to finish up our series, which I didn't realize was going to be a series, but it ended up being a series on God's business. Uh, we have been for the last couple of weeks, and today being, by the way, we have, after this Sunday, we have two more Sundays before the end of, before the beginning of next year, before the end of this year. We have two more Sundays but, uh, this year, and then we'll be done. So it, it's, it's moving along quickly. Christmas uh, is a week from this Friday. Are you ready for that? Christmas is a week from this Friday. Oh, my goodness. So anyway, uh, just kind of give you some perspective on that. Let's uh, pray and ask the Lord to bless the hearing of his word. Father God, we praise you today. We thank you for your presence here in this place. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe, for, for, for providing for our needs, for keeping us in the palm of your hands this year and this year of all years um, uh, that's been quite a year for all of us and for the world. Thank you, Lord God, that you're faithful. We pray, God, now that you'd be faithful to let your word um, minister to our hearts. We open up our hearts to your word today. We open up our hearts to your spirit today. We open up our hearts to receive that word. Father, may we, may we have an open heart, a receiving heart, a willing heart to not just hear it, but to do it. Lord, that we would be more than hearers, but that we would be doers of your word. We, 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 in advance of all that we're going to be uh, listening to today, we make a commitment to say we receive it and we'll walk it out. Help us to do that, Holy Spirit. Minister to our hearts. Take away every distraction, everything that would keep us from receiving this word today. And Lord, I pray for fertile soil right now for those that are here in this room and for those that are viewing this broadcast on Facebook Live. Everybody within the sound of my voice. Father, we lay aside distractions and we now engage in your word and in your presence. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen, amen, amen. Again, we welcome you here. If you're viewing also on Facebook Live, we're so glad to have you. Feel free to give us a thumbs up to let us know that you're with us. And feel free to also make comments in the comment section uh, as the Lord lays that on your heart. If you have any prayer requests as well, please let us know that as well. We'll be happy to, to pray uh, and lift up those situations uh, to the Lord on your behalf. Now, in the Old Testament, what we looked at a couple of weeks ago, and we started a couple of weeks ago with this, in the Old Testament, we read and understand about God's, in God's Word that the, 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 uh, the presence of the Lord was in a temple that they built. But in the New Testament, we see that the presence of the Lord is in us, because we are the temple. It's not just a building, one place, but it's in and through all of us now that He resides and flows out from. And we looked in Ezekiel chapter 47 about this river that's flowing out from the temple uh, uh, that was in this vision that Ezekiel had. And this river that was flowing out, everywhere that it touched, it brought life and it brought abundance. Everywhere that the river went, there was life. And we see, based on all of this in the last couple of weeks, and I'm going to just ask you one more time. What is God's business? Souls. You guys are listening. I'm so happy. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. His business is souls. Souls for this kingdom, for, for his kingdom. We see that God is business, God's in the business of souls. And we see based on this Ezekiel chapter 47 vision that that's really his business model for his church. If God is the CEO of a business and his business is souls, then we are his employees, and his business model is found in Ezekiel chapter 47. I like how someone actually made a comment in the, in the Facebook comments last week on the Facebook Live, how not only are we employees, in fact, I think this was you, Paul, not only are we employees, but also him being our Heavenly Father, we have uh, uh, that relational thing going on too. So he's not only our boss, but he's our father, so it's a family business. I like that. We're in the family business. Isn't that great? Not just employees, but we're in the family business, and his business is souls. And God is laser-focused. We get distracted about a lot of different things that are going on in our personal life, in our nation, in the world. 
But, and God's not distracted by any of it. He's very aware of it. And in fact, he's in charge of everything. So keep that in mind. He's not just standing back saying, I don't know what's going on here. What must I do about it? I have no idea. He's got it. God's got this. But he's not distracted by it. And he's not spinning off into some sort of tangent. He's laser focused on redeeming mankind back to himself through Jesus Christ's finished work. That's his primary goal. He's focused on souls and re redeeming us back to himself through Jesus Christ's finished work. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. First, God's business model is one of expansion and not contraction. This is just a real quick review. It went if you read the if you read Ezekiel 47, it went from ankle to knee to waist to over it, over the head and it deepened and widened as it flowed out. You see from the upper room where the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost to today, where we are in 2020, December 2020, God's business model, God's church has expanded to reach every corner and crevice of the world. There's nowhere where God's presence and God's church hasn't impacted this world. The gospel is being preached to everyone everywhere just as Jesus commanded his church to do, us, in Mark 16, 15, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That is be That has been done, that is being done, and that will continue to be accomplished until Jesus returns. We're guaranteed this in fact because Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18 that I will build my church. This is Jesus saying this. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Know this. No matter what Satan's plans are for the world and for you and for the church, they will not prevail against God's plans. God's plans will prevail. Amen. God's purposes are going to succeed, amen? In your life, in this church, and in the world, God's plans are going to succeed. Isn't that good to know? No matter what the devil may mean for evil, God's going to bring it around for good in your life, in the life of this church, in the life of his church, and in the life of this world. Know that, that he's going to build his church. The church is not going to contract. The church is not going to get weaker. The church is not going to reduce its influence. Jesus said, I will build my church. Which means that, in the, that we are in the better days. The greater days are ahead for the church. We've got to know that it will expand. It will increase. It will, it will keep a greater influence on the world than ever before. Because his spirit in the last days is going to be poured out, is being poured out right now through his church, out from his church, to a world that is in desperate need of it. The church's best days are ahead, not behind us. Know that. Here's the second part of God's business model. It's one of transformation and not stagnation. Ezekiel described that everywhere that this river touched... It was dramatically changed. Remember we talked about being exploding dynamite? Have you exploded like dynamite this past week? Have you impacted people's lives? You are the church. You are the exploding dynamite. Christ through you explodes. And it completely, just like exploding dynamite does, it completely transforms everyone everywhere. We are dynamite. We have dyna d dynamos dynamos in us. That's what the Holy Spirit is all about. It's an exploding dynamite sort of impact. But how many knows that if you have dynamite just laying there, but if you don't light it, it's just dynamite. It's just sitting there. You got to light that thing. Light it up and let it explode. You, all of you and all of us in this church, all of the church have the capacity for dynamite, but we must explode it. We can't just keep it inside of us. We must be like exploding dynamite. The power that is in us wasn't meant to stay in us. If you read Ezekiel 47, the water didn't stay inside the temple. It flowed out. And it increased. And it expanded. And everywhere that it, it touched, it brought life. That flowing out of the river revolutionizes the world that we live in for the kingdom of God. And God is calling us to be revolutionary sons and daughters of the most high God because Jesus being our example did the same thing think about it everywhere that he went he transformed lives everywhere that he went he, ne he didn't leave it the same as when he came in and we can and we must do the same thing as we allow the Holy Spirit to do it through us and explode like dynamite Know this, the gospel message, it never changes. It's always the same. The real change happens in how you convey it 
and what it does in changing people's lives that hear it and receive it. So let's make sure that we leave a kingdom mark everywhere we go. A kingdom mark. Now, I, I, there's some people that leave a mark wherever they go. And maybe you leave a mark wherever you go. But I hope that you're leaving a kingdom mark wherever you go. Not the mark of who you are. Not the mark of how you used to be. But the mark of how Christ has made you to be. And making a kingdom mark is what Christ has called us to do. Amen? Here's the third thing we looked at last week. God's business model is one of abundance and not lack. Now this abundance in God's kingdom isn't in things, it isn't in possessions, it isn't in riches, it isn't in those sort of things. We take that whole scripture, that whole concept rather I should say, and say, hey we're going to name it and claim it. And we're just going to ask for it and God's just going to give it to me. Because God just wants to bless me and he wants to bless me so I have a bunch of things. But that's the name and claim it gospel that we have nothing to do with here. Because God is not going to be a God that's going to be manipulated. We've twisted this truth that God is a God of abundance to our own selfish goals and our own selfish pursuits. But God is not in the business of raising spoiled children. He's not going to give us everything that we pray for just because we ask. He is not some heavenly vending machine. God knows what, he, that knows what we need. And He knows what's best for us. You see, when we say that He's a God of abundance and not lack, His instruction and His expectation for us is to put our goals aside and to put our kingdom aside and to put our desires aside and to put His goals ahead of our own, to put His kingdom ahead of our own, to put His desires ahead of our own. His business is souls. His desire is souls. His goals are souls. His kingdom is about souls and so should ours be. So when we look about this being the God of abundance, we realize that we seek first His kingdom, and we seek first His righteousness, and then we can be confident, because God's Word promises this. God's Word promises that we can be confident that all these other things, these pursuits, these goals, these desires, will be added unto us. God is a God of abundance and not lack. And that abundance that He provides for us is all about expanding His kingdom and not ours. In the midst of all that we're facing here in 2020, we probably have one of the best opportunities in our lifetime to share the hope that we have in Christ. There's more people in despair, in fear, and confusion than ever before. And we're right here as just they're ripe for the picking. Opportunities to share the hope and the joy that we have in Christ. We can counter people's despair with hope. We can counter their anxiety with peace. We can counter their depression with joy. We can counter their anger with love. We can point people to Jesus and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to give us the words to say that will explode like dynamite into their hearts and transform them from, from who they are to all that Christ has for them to be in Him. What a great opportunity that we have. The church's best days are ahead, folks. And I believe that we are going to see an abundance of people turning to Jesus Christ in these last days as His Spirit is being poured out like never before through His temple, through you and I, through the church, expanding out from us and transforming lives for His glory, which as we finish up today, let's get back to our text in Ezekiel 47, and we're going to look at God's fourth business model fourth aspect of his business model and that's this if you're taking notes write this down God is in the business God's business model is life and not death life and not death in Ezekiel 47 we're going to start in verse 9 and I'll read it follow along please in your Bibles or on the screen and it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live there will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from in Gedi to in Egliam. They will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. 
Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. You see, when sin entered the human race, so did death. God originally made Adam and Eve to be immortal. The sinless lives that they had, they had no corruption or death in them. Their bodies were perfect. And they communed with God face to face in the Garden of Eden on a daily basis. Before their fall, they were to live forever in their uncorrupted bodies in God's presence. Think about that. Crawl back to Genesis chapter 1 before the fall. When they fell into temptation by disobeying God's command to not eat of the tr tree of good and evil, sin immediately entered into their lives and their immortal bodies immediately became mortal and filled with death. The uncorrupted became corrupted. And from that moment, their bodies began to slowly age and die. That's what's happening to us today. And pastor, you may be looking at me, you may be saying, pastor, you have no idea. You don't know the half of it. <laughs> but from the very first moment, you see, we're all born into sin. Every single one of us are not exempt from that. Only Jesus was born sinless. But all the rest of us are in the same camp, born into sin. From the moment we're born, our bodies begin the process of aging, which eventually leads to death. No one is exempt. But know this, that this was not God's original plan. His original plan is that we might live forever in a perfectly glorified and sinless, immortal body. We read, though, in John 10.10, 10, it really is kind of a tag on what he did in, in, in what Satan did in Genesis chapter 3. Satan's goal is to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's his job description. If Satan were to have another business and his mode of operation and his goals, his whole thing about, hey, this is what we're going to do, Satan and all the demons and everybody, we're going to steal, we're going to kill, and we're going to destroy. That's his business. And we and we got to we got to say that that's exactly what he's done, and he's done a pretty good job of it. He's stolen from us God's original plan in the garden. Go back to Genesis and read it. Tempting Adam and Eve, he stole from them after deceiving them. And certainly, they gave it; they, they they yielded to it. But ultimately, Satan stole them. He killed them. He destroyed their lives. Satan hates us because God loves us. Satan hates us because he knows that there's no chance for him. So he's going to try and take as many with him to hell as he possibly can. Misery loves company, and Satan is the most miserable being that I know. But the counter that we find in John 10.10 10 to Satan's job description of stealing and killing and destroying is there in John 10.10, 10, the flip side of it. I love it. The verse is so succinct. It's one of my favorite verses because we see... We see the oh no of the first part, what Satan wants to do. But then we see the praise the Lord of the second part. That says that Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly to the full. Jesus has come to reverse the curse. Jesus has come to redeem us out of our death. And he's come to rescue us and put us back to right relationship with God the Father. We need to understand that when Jesus came and he died, and he died in our place, that we are now... Understanding that that's the down payment for the eternal life and the eternal glorified body that we're going to have with him again. What once was will be again. What was in Genesis is going to be in Revelation. He's going to restore everything back to how it was through Jesus' finished work. Jesus is just simply the down payment for that. And we have received that gift, but we look forward to our blessed hope that one day all of this will take place. Amen? Amen. Jesus said this in Revelation 1.18. This is Jesus speaking. I am the living one. I was dead. And now, look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Hallelujah to that. Jesus has conquered death and hell and the grave. So that when we die, our physical bodies, or if we're living when the rapture takes place, our bodies will be instantly made incorruptible in the twinkling of an eye, just as Adam and Eve's bodies were before they fell into sin. Because God is in the business of life and not death. As we place our faith in Jesus today, 
He cleanses us from our sins. And he places us back in right relationship with God. As they were in the garden. And he promises his eternal life in a glorified, resurrected, sinless, immortal body that will never age. Never experience pain. Never get sick. And never die. How many is looking forward to that day? How it was in Genesis before the fall will be how it will eventually be one day again in God's presence for all of eternity. And we're in between those two events, between the fall and the, resur- the restoration. We're in between those two, but I believe with all my heart that based on the signs of the times, that we aren't somewhere so in the middle of that. We're actually, I believe, we're, we're, we're just moments away. We're just like way over here. If this is the restoration of all things and that's the fall, we're like right here. In fact, if the restoration, if that event is midnight, I believe with all my heart, we're at 11.59 and 59 seconds. We're just right there. So what must we do, folks? If God is a God, if His business model is one of life and not death, what must we do? And what must we do? If we're listening here today and we're thinking, you know, I, I, I want to believe in Jesus, but I'm not, I haven't really given my life to Him, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. You got my attention. Okay, tell me what I need to do. So here it comes. First off, we need to stay close to the water. Write that down. Stay close to the water. Stay close to the water. You know, if you're familiar at all with the space program, NASA, and all the different things that are going on out there, they are very intrigued with the possibility of life on Mars. They actually see, they think, as signs of possible water on that planet. And the the key to that is, the, the connecting is saying, if there's water, then possibly life will exist. And I'm just going to say as a side, yeah, that's great. Let's mess up Mars like we messed up Earth. You know, can you imagine? I think Mars is probably going, no, you guys keep the problems down there and we're fine, we're good. But that's a different message. You see, water brings life. Water sustains life. Water makes things grow. Everywhere there is drinkable and clean and fresh water, there's an abundance of life. Did you know that we couldn't survive without water? Obviously, you know that. Our bodies, the one that you're living in right now, roughly 60% of it is composed of water. 60%. Talk about water weight, huh? I mean, we could just lose that. Think about that. 60% of our body is composed of water. We would die if our bodies were deprived of water, some studies say, if in just after a few days without water. We would die. Water is essential for life. And we see in our text in verse 7 that the trees, there's some trees that lived along the banks of the river. Just like I shared last week as, as we drove from Southern California through Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, it was pretty barren. It's pretty brown. There wasn't trees and grass there. There was nothing but rocks and hills and a few little oil rigs kind of doing this sort of thing. That's all I saw. I saw no trees. I grew up where there were no trees. I grew up in Southern California where I didn't realize how desert-like it was. But the closer that I got to uh, the the Mississippi River, it got uh, something amazing took place. It started getting greener and I thought, what's all this? Trees and grass and shrubs and I've never seen the like. The closer we got, the greener it got. And that's how God wants us to live. The closer we are to the river, the greener we'll be. The closer we are to the river of life, the more fruit, the more produce, the more effective, the more life we will have. That's how God wants us to live, always accessing the river. There's a couple of scriptures here that speak to that. I love these verses. Write them down. Psalm 1, 3 describes such a person. This should be us. The one who delights in the Lord is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. How are you delighting in the Lord? Are you delighting in the Lord? What are you delighting in is probably the best question to ask. Because whatever it is that you delight in is where you're going to extract your strength and source of energy from. And every other thing that you have tapped into is limited. It's not as healthy as it needs to be. And it's not, uh, it's not something that's going to help you long term. But if you'll tap into your primary source of your delight, what is it that you delight in? Who is it that you delight in? What are the things in your life that are top priority in your life that you take great delight in? that you tap into on a regular basis, I can promise you that those things that you delight in, if they're not of God, 
are not going to be healthy to your, to your, to your soul. But if you'll take delight in the Lord, the Bible says you're blessed. You'll be like a tree planted by the streams of water. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a comparison. It's an analogy to say, if you'll delight in the Lord, if you'll tap into your roots, into the deep parts of the river, right by the river, and extract a never-ending basis from the river of life, you're going to have fruit that's going to be in season, and your leaf is never going to wither. You're never going to experience diminishment. Whatever you do is going to prosper as you delight in the Lord. Jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8 continues with this. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worry in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. In 2020, we've heard of a lot of people that are struggling in their finances. They've lost their jobs and different things like that. They're struggling with different things of fear. Maybe they're struggling in health situations. And I'm not here to say that you're exempt from all that because you trust in the Lord. But I'm here to tell you that as you delight in the Lord, as you place your trust in Him, as you place your confidence in Him based on what God's Word says, and God is not a man that He would lie, and you can put your name right here in this scripture and say, wait a minute, I'm going to let my roots grow down to the river here and it's going to tap into it. And just because all around me things are going on that seem to be drought-like and seem to be where there's a lot of heat, I'm going to just be full and fruitful and my leaves are not going to wither because even though all around me looks like pretty bad, my roots are deep into placing my confidence and hope. Into, into my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you today to let your roots go down deep and tap into. You know, the, the, remember that old song that says, just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. I'm not going to let the, the storms of life mess with me or, 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 or cause me to sway. I'm not going to be distracted by what's going on in 2020. I'm going to keep my roots tapped into the river of life because Jesus Christ is my source. How many can say amen to that? You know, no matter what may come our way, no matter what pandemic, no matter, no matter what political agenda or movement, no matter what plan of the enemy, those who trust in the Lord and stay rooted in the river of life will not only survive, but they will thrive and they will prosper in no matter what situation. Amen? Because you see, there is no death in God, only life. Because God is a God of life and not death. There's no withering in Him, only fruitfulness. There's no drought in Him, only plenty. As believers were instructed in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. There it is again. What are you rooted in? What are you taking delight in? Delight in the Lord. Root yourself in Him. And know that no matter what, He's with you. And He'll bring fruitfulness in and through your life. And this rootedness is connected with an overflowing. So it's not just enough for you. But you got enough to give out to others. A fruit tree that is hanging out with some apples isn't pulling back his branches and saying, No, you can't pick from me, is it? You go and you take the fruit. And you go back the next week and there's some more fruit because the tree is producing the fruit because it's deeply rooted and it's being nourished and it's being watered. That's what Christ wants to do through us. There's a lot of people out there that need fruit. They need blessings. They need to be ministered to. They're in a drought situation. They're experiencing the heat. But we're not going to pull back and say, oh, you can't have my fruit. Our fruit that we have is meant to bless. Our fruit that we have is meant not only to provide for our needs, but for those around us. Amen? Yeah. And no matter what that looks like, it can be of our time, our talent, our treasure, whatever it is, we're an extension of Christ and we're blessing, we're blessing, we're blessing. This overflowing river that is pouring out from us is exploding like dynamite and it's transforming lives as we go. You know, we see in verse 9, there are swarms of living creatures in wide variety, living wherever the river flows. Death caused by sin is truly all around us. I, I like to just use the term dead men walking, and it's true. P 
people that don't have Christ in their lives are like dead men walking. Absolutely. It really is the truth. We're, if we're not alive in Christ, we're dead to ourselves, and we might as well be dead physically. There we're certainly dead spiritually. You know, we see these dead people that are walking. I mean, they're just walking through life. They're working, paying their bills, doing their yard work, raising their kids, and then doing whatever else that they do. But they don't have the life of Christ in them, and so they're, they're sad. They're empty. They're trying to fill their lives in other ways, these voids that are there. And really, there's just one void. It's a void. It's a God-shaped hole in all of us that only God can fill. But they try to fill it with other things. So in their lifestyles, the words that they say, that their habits, their preferences, their beliefs, the different ways that we see and we go, wow, how can they even believe that way? How can they even live that way? How can they even, how can they even walk that path? Why are they in that habit, that lifestyle? It, it, it's incomprehensible maybe to some of us as to how people can get so deeply into these things and be so lost. How they can run so headlong towards hell down a slippery slope and not even realize it. But yet, we see it all around us, dead men walking. But this river that's flowing out from us has the capacity to bring life to every person it touches. This river that's flowing out from us brought swarms of life, as we read in our text. Swarms of life. Not just one or two, not just ten or twelve, but millions and millions and millions. And I believe that God wants to do through this church and through your life and through His church abundantly more than we can ever hope or imagine. We have an imagination. Well, God, if you can just save 10, through, 10 people through me, praise God. Just 100 people through me, I'll be happy. Just 1,000 people through me, I'm good. But I want to challenge you with this. Whatever number you have in your head, blow it out of the water, Lord God. And help me to believe what you want to do through me. That it will be countless swarms of people that will come to know you through my life as I yield to you and allow the river to flow out from me. Don't limit God as to what he can do in you and through you. Because everywhere this river flowed, it brought swarms of life. That's God's plan for us. That's his business model. Don't forget that Christ in us can through us see death swallowed up in victory and life can be restored to those living as dead men walking. There's a verse that are, that are many times read at funerals, but it also, I believe, applies to us still breathing, but walking in the shadow of death's sin grip. I've read this scripture many times at funerals. It goes like this. It's for, found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 57. When the perishable have been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the power of sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to realize that that not only takes place when those that die in Christ are resurrected and immediately in God's presence, but we also realize that that happens spiritually at the moment that we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Death has been swallowed up in life. And we say to that, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord as we received Him as Lord and Savior. Amen? So at that moment that we receive Christ, it's the down payment again where the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. That's what happens when we receive Christ. We become instantly immortal and instantly uh, imperishable. At least our souls do. Our bodies are going to have to be renewed because this old flesh and blood is not going to be able to make it through the stratosphere and into heaven. It's going to, it's going to explode. So he has to do something with this thing. And he will instantaneously make me an imperishable, immortal being where I can be instantly in heaven and he'll do the same for you. And that'll happen in the twinkling of an eye at the rapture or when we breathe our last. And I hope we can all make it in the rapture. I hope not one of us pass away before the rapture and I hope we'll all make it in the rapture. Amen? Amen. That's a good prayer. Amen? How many's ready to go? <laughs> what if it happens before we hear, end here today? Are you good with that? 
If you need to pray, we're going to pray before this thing ends and we'll make sure everybody gets on that bus and not on a later bus. You don't want to get on that later bus, I promise you. You see, when people accept Christ, they go from death to life. When this river of explodes like dynamite into people's lives, it brings them from perishable to imperishable, from mortal to immortal, from death to life in Christ because God is in the business of life and not death. Amen. It becomes in them a down payment of what will eventually be complete in their lives when they see and when we all see Jesus face to face to live forever in his presence. That's what God's business model is all about. And he's looking for us, his employees, his children in the family business to be about our father's business of souls for his kingdom. Remember when Jesus was asked when he was about 12 years old, they had to go back, Mary and Joseph had to go back to the city and say, why didn't you follow us in the caravan? It's been a few days. We didn't see you. We had to come back and get you. And he says, I have to be about my father's business. Wow. That's what he wants us to be, to be about our father's business. You know, there's a pile a pile of Lazarus is walking around in our community. Dead men walking and women. They need to be resurrected from spiritual death to life in Christ. And just as Jesus spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth, we can speak to the Lazaruses in our community and say, friend, come forth. Call out their names and call them from death to life. So I want to see us get out there. I want to, I want to encourage you to get out there and see God bring them to life with this life-giving good news that we have to share because his word brings life. Write that down. His word brings life. His word brings life. I want to read to you Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 12. As you're writing that down, we see in verse 12 all kinds of fruit trees growing along its banks that brings constant food and healing. Listen to this. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. I'm so thankful this morning. I'm thankful for medicines that heal us and foods that give us the nutrition that we need to live well. And I'm not talking about Twinkies and Ding Dongs either. I'm talking about the fruits and vegetables. Those are the best things. But hey, give me a Twinkie and a Ding Dong and I'll eat it too. But I'm thankful. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm all, I'm going to be just full, full disclosure. I love, I love some sweets every once in a while. All right. I'm okay with that. Uh, it used to be a little more salty and I still am, but I, I like some sweets too. You know, give me, give me a glass of milk and some chocolate chip cookies and, and you won't see me for about 30 minutes. <laughs> but I'm thankful for medicines and I'm thankful for, um, for foods that bring life to us, the nutrition, all the different vitamins and stuff that we need to live well. But I'm equally thankful for the spiritual food and healing that God brings through His Word. Aren't you thankful for His Word that brings healing to us? Absolutely. There's a great encouragement to us found in Proverbs about this. If you will, read it in your, you can read it on the screen. You can write this scripture down and look at it later. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22 says, My child, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. Life and health are found in that precious book that you're holding in your hands today. And unless you crack that book, it's not going to do you any good. You've heard me say this before, but... If you walk around with that thing strapped on the top of your head and stick a, a ribbon around your chin and walk around with it all day, you got a book on top of your head, that's it. You're just going to be silly. It, just, it will not absorb into your brain that way. It's not going to somehow just seep in there. you got to crack the book. you got to get in there and engage in God's Word. And when you do, it starts getting in your heart and you begin to delight at His Word. And it begins, it begins to give life to you and health to your bones. That's the spiritual health that we need. The spiritual food that we need. The spiritual medicine that we need to bring to us the health that we need. We get sick a lot spiritually and emotionally and mentally and relationally and financially. There's a lot of sickness out there in a lot of areas of our life because we don't eat the right things spiritually, do we? 
We tap into the Oprah stuff and the Dr. Phil stuff, which has some sort of nutrition in it, but it's not fully based in God's Word. We tap into this self-help thing and this self-help thing and all these other sort of things are out there, and we start tapping into this, and we push God's Word aside because this is the latest and the greatest, and everybody else is doing it, and it's a bestseller on the charts. But if it's not founded in God's word, if it's not established upon God's word, if it doesn't point you back to placing your hope in Jesus Christ, then it's kind of like junk food. It's going to kind of, maybe it's going to do its best to pull out what it can to help you. But you're going to find yourself getting sick with your relationships, a little bit off with your finances, emotional sort of it, sort of spiritual stuff like, I'm not feeling too good mentally. There's things are not going, I'm, I, this is not right. Why? Because you're junk in, junk out. If you're not eating the right stuff, it's not going to come out good. Same way as you look at the scale and you look at the mirror and you say, why am I gaining so much weight? Well, how about checking your pantry and seeing what you're putting in your mouth? It's the same sort of thing spiritually. We must feed on God's Word so that God's Word can give us health and strength and life. You know, there's power. In a now word. There's power in a, in a rhema word. There's power in that, that alive word that it, 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 as you speak it out, it spiritually transforms the atmosphere. Kelly and I were actually talking about this week how words are powerful. And the words that we say will impact the spiritual climate of where we are. We've got to be careful because the words that we say... I believe with all my heart words are powerful because the Bible says that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. And so if we speak words of death, meaning I may not make it, I may not have enough money, I may not live to, through this COVID, I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure my relationship's going to make it. I, I, see what I'm saying? Go ahead, just seed the ground with that and see what happens. But if you take, if you take those thoughts captive, the Bible says, Cast them down and replace them with what God's word says. Wait a minute. My, my, my Bible says that he's going to, my God says he's going to provide for me all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My, 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 my God says, my God said I need to repeat, believe the report of the Lord and not the report of man. My, my Bible says that he's going to walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death and I should fear no evil. I, I'm going to take what God's word says and whatever it is that you've got stored up in your heart. And if it's not stored up in there, you're not going to be able to access it, you see? Kind of like the pantry situation again. If you don't buy the good stuff in your pantry and your refrigerator, but you want to eat a carrot, but all you've done is bought a, a, a Twinkie, then that's what you got. But let's go ahead and load up the refrigerator with the pantry with the stuff that's healthy, right? So that when you open up the pantry, you're going to go, ah, yeah, and you eat it. Same with us spiritually. you got to get into God's Word. you got to load up your pantry so that when you need it, when the tests come, when the challenge comes, when the fear comes, when all that comes, you say, wait a minute, God's word says this, and you are accessing it. The spirit of the Lord brings it to the forefront, and it becomes an alive now word for you. Amen. You see, God is a God of life and not death. Amen. But we also have a play on this thing, because life and death, as I said, is in the power of the tongue. So be careful what you say. They can bring hope or hopelessness, fear or death, life, fear or faith, or life or death. Let's stop rehearsing the problems. Because there's plenty of them to rehearse. Isn't there? I mean, sure. Go ahead. Rehearse the problems. Be my guest. You're not helping the situation at all. In fact, you're making it worse. Stop rehearsing the problems. And instead, start rehearsing God's promises. Start declaring God's promises. Start putting God's word into the atmosphere. And let God then be able to do something with that. Oh, it's so powerful. Life and death. And the power. It, it, the power of life and death is in our tongue. So many times we speak in such a way that we give no room or place for God to work. But as we allow the Holy Spirit to take captive our thoughts. And yield our tongues. And we speak that life-giving word of God over our situations. It will change the spiritual atmosphere around us. And it will eventually turn things around in our lives. Whether Even, even if it doesn't necessarily impact anything on the outside, it's sure going to make a difference on the inside. That's the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. It's the same thing. It's, it's what's going on on the inside. Verse 12 describes trees as having fruit and leaves that impact people. 
that it reaches. It says their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. As, as we know, God's word is food for us. God's word is healing for us. And there's this beautiful dancing relationship that takes place with this. We have God's word. We have God's spirit in us. And as we engage daily with him in into commun intimate communion, it, 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 things begin, they, they stay fresh. Uh, they don't get stale. I, I, we bought a loaf of bread last week, but I, I know that if I try to keep it up in the pantry and I pull it out a year from now, ah, I'm not going to want that bread, right? I mean, I need that fresh man. I, I need some fresh bread. But pastor, I read, I read some verses about six months ago. Great. It, mm, you might want to kind of keep it fresh, right? Don't let, don't let your relationship with the Lord get stale. As you read God's word, it's going to help things remain clear and new and alive. And there's never going to be an off season of your life when you do that. Our text says that every month they're going to bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. As we prioritize time with God, worship him, meditate on his word, invite the Holy Spirit to fill us and to flow out from us. What comes out will be fresh and alive and life-giving on a regular basis. As you do, our text says, your leaves will never wither and your fruit will never fail. There's a supernatural spring that flows up from us. It's not a natural spring. It's a supernatural spring. You ever buy a bottle of water and you see on the, on the label it says, from a natural spring source natural spring source. I often wonder about that, but I just, okay, whatever. <laughs> I can see this big old factory, you know, where it's just coming out. I, I don't know. Maybe it's called natural factory, and so it's a natural spring source, natural spring factory. I don't know. But the, but, the, but the source that we have is supernatural. It's guaranteed. This water that's flowing from the temple is not just any old water, but it's special water. Say, I got special water in me. Yeah, that special water is anointed. That special water is holy. That special water is supernatural. It's unlike anything that the world can even begin to offer. That special water comes directly from the throne of God. It comes in through us and then it impacts those around us. There's nothing that can compare. Amen. Remember the old song that we used to sing in church that says, I've got a river of life flowing out from me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Yeah, and then spring up a well, yeah. So it's a command, of course, it says spring up a well. It's a command to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to keep it inside of me. I'm commanding it to spring up, not only within me, but out to that life abundantly. That will impact other people's lives. As we allow this supernatural, never-ending fruitful river to flow out from us it'll bring provision and healing to all who would believe and I close with this we'll never be 100% successful keep that in mind verse 11 actually speaks to this in our text it's a pretty positive 12 verses but there's one verse tucked in there that's kind of a downer verse and it goes like this but its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Hmm. A little bit of a contrast, a little bit of a balance there. You see, there's folks that are out there. There's folks that are even listening to this today. That for whatever reason, they're just choosing to flatly reject the good news. They reject this free gift, this rescue from certain death. But we should never not try just because of the swamps and the marshes. This is probably one of the more sad verses in the Bible when you think about it. Because it's really speaking to not swamps and marshes, but it's speaking to people's hearts. It's speaking to people that have been turned over to a reprobate mind. To people that are just so embraced evil and are so blinded by it that there's going to be swamps and marshes in their heart and that will never be regenerated. Not that God can't do it, but that they just make a choice for that to not happen. They just block it off. But again, it should never discourage us in our attempt to tell others about Jesus. We can't look at that verse and say, well, there's swamps and marshes, so why even try? Because there's another 11 verses of those... 12 that speak to the river of life flowing out from us and making a huge impact. 
The Bible says that we plant in water, God brings the increase. Jesus even used the example to say there's a lot of soils out there. There's rocky soil, hard soil, vine-filled soil, and then fertile soil. You think about that, that's only a 25% success rate on that one. And if you're not careful, you can look at that. If, you look, if you're a glass half empty sort of person and say, well, why even try? Well, I'm glad someone tried with me. How about you? You know, the old analogy about the guy throwing the starfish back into the ocean. There's thousands of starfish, and he keeps throwing one at a time back into the ocean. A guy walks by and says, there's certainly no way that you can make a difference here with all these starfish. How much of a difference do you think that you can make? He picked up another starfish, and he threw it back in the water. He said, I made a difference in that one. You see, there's a lot of starfish out there, right? Jason, I know you were one a few years ago. You came into this place, and God made a difference in your life. And God made a difference in all of our lives at some point in our lives because someone chose to take us as a starfish and make a difference in our lives and throw us back into the water so that there was a chance. And there's always a chance in everybody's life. No one is so far gone. And we can't be God. We can't be the one to say, well, their swamp's in Marsh's heart and there's nothing we can do with them. You let God take care of that. We plant water and let God bring the increase. All we're responsible for is doing, staying in our lane and doing what God's called us to do with obedience. And then let God minister to their hearts. He knows who they are. He knows where they are. He sees the big picture and he is going to make the difference in their lives. I'm going to make a difference. How about you? I'm going to be faithful. How about you? It's not for us to know what's going on in the inside of these folks. It's only for us to obey and leave the rest to God. Swamps and marshes will be in every generation. But just as this life-giving water transformed much of where it touched, so will the Lord transform through us those whose hearts are open and ready for the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord, as we quickly approach Christmas and the end of this most challenging year, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to stay keenly alert to the opportunities that we have to allow this river, this supernatural river, this abundant river of God, to flow out from us. May it expand. May it deepen. May it bring life. And may there be souls for your kingdom as a result. May your kingdom expand through us. Transform people's lives through us. Abundantly bring life to those walking in the shadow of death through us. Father God, we repent of every opportunity that has come our way that we've walked away from, second-guessed you or ignored. We pray against fear. We pray against busyness. We pray against complacency. Father, revive us and put in us the fire that we had once before and help us to see people as you see them, as souls that you love and that you gave your son for. Jesus, don't let us look at people in a judgmental way. Don't let us condemn them to hell as swamp and marshy hearts but father god help us to reach out to them and let you take care of bringing the increase as we walk in obedience we have probably the best opportunity lord jesus of any generation for a long 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 time to tell someone about you help us to do it lord god open up our mouths let the river flow out from us and we thank you for this with every eye closed and every head bowed i want to ask you this morning whether you're viewing this on the broadcast or you're here in this room if this morning you're not sure that if that trumpet were to sound and Jesus Christ were to come and catch up his bride the church away in what we know as the rapture it's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye it's a moment you're not going to have a chance to make the decision after it takes place or during it it needs to be made now before it And if you're not sure that you have Jesus in your heart, if you're not sure that you're washed clean of your sins, if you're not sure you're in right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right now. All He's wanting, all God's plan is, is to restore you back to right relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. It's a restored relationship that was broken in the garden. You were born in sin. 
There's nothing you can do about it, but there's everything that Jesus has already done about it. And you simply just make the decision to say, I receive the gift. I accept him into my heart. I want to be restored back to God the Father through Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's only one way to do that, and it's through Jesus Christ. You confess your sins, the Bible says, with your mouth. You believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is God's son, that he was raised from the dead, that he paid the price for you. And if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart these things, the Bible says you will be saved. You'll be restored back to right relationship with God the Father. Oh, I hope you want that today. I want to give you the opportunity. If that's you this morning, I want you to lift up your hand, put it right back down and say, Pastor, I want to get back to right relationship with God. I need, I need to do that. I've made a mess. I've made some decisions. I'm going in the wrong direction. I need to repent. And I need to ask Jesus in my heart, would you lift up your hand and put it right back down? And we'll pray a prayer together in just a few moments. All of us out loud together in this room. Anybody at all, lift up your hand and put it right back down. If this morning you're viewing this on Facebook Live, I want you to just also lift up your hand wherever you are in that room that you're, that you're viewing this. And you can put it right back down. But I just want you to outwardly make that sign, that, that outward motion. And we're all going to pray together. Would you all pray this prayer out loud together? All of us together viewing this and all of us in this room. Say, Jesus, I need a Savior. I'm a sinner. And I thank you that you died for my sins. You took my place. I want to be restored back to right relationship with God my Father through you. So I confess my sins. I repent of my sins. I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and to be the Lord of my life. Come live in my heart and help me to walk this out on a daily basis. An intimate, vital, ever-growing relationship with God. I thank you now that I'm saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, fill each one confirm in their hearts the decision that they made. Help them to know that this is real and something they can walk out and come alive to us, all of us in this place as we walk this, out this relationship with you on a daily basis. Amen. Listen, I want to encourage you today. Spend time in God's Word. Replace what's in your pantry of your heart. Junk out, good stuff in. And then let His Word wash over you and wash out from you and bring fruit and life and health and healing to those around you. Let's be the church. We've had church. Now let's go out and be the church. We, we've, been, we've been called. Now let's go out and walk it out. We've been instructed. Now let's put feet and hands and mouths on it, right? Let, let, let's, let's be the church.